Okay, welcome to tonight's uh, Thursday. I won't call it a lecture. Uh, I think it's going to be more of a, a testimonial and a discussion. Um, it's a little different format than we've had before, uh, but maybe a little more interesting as a result. So we're going to talk about how international experiences as students led to an interest in family medicine. Um, and I suppose the underlying agenda here might be that some of you might find that the testimonials you're going to hear tonight uh, might motivate you to have an interest in family medicine as well. Uh, the discussion leader is Dr. Narissa Kern, and I think you're all aware that she's my daughter, and she is the Associate Program Director of the Family Medicine Residency of Western Montana. That is a three-year specialty training program in family medicine for physicians who have completed medical school but aren't fully ready to go out and practice on their own yet. Uh, the family residency program is based at the Partnership Health Center, which you've heard about earlier in one of the lectures, a local federally qualified community health center <coughs> that was created to train new doctors to work in rural and underserved areas of Montana. And that's its primary goal and mission, and I'm sure that's going to be a subject that will come up in the course of the discussion tonight. So, uh, Marissa, I'll let you introduce uh, the other uh, speakers that we have. Thanks. Am I picking up just... Perfect. Um, let me know if you can't hear. Uh, so, I'm Narissa Kern, and um, we're planning to do this evening is just sort of an informal panel discussion. Just we'll start by each introducing ourselves and talking a little bit about our backgrounds and some of the things that we've done and how we got interested in family medicine. Um, we have three residents here who are all in their first year of residency. The family medicine residency is a three-year training program. Um, so you'll get to know them all in a little bit, but Emma Wright, Justin Perry, and Felicia Lucas. And I'll start by giving just a little bit of my background, um, but again, I'll try and keep it brief because I think, you know, these residents are a lot closer in terms of their training to the stage of life that you all are at currently and some of the decisions and pathways that you're focused on. Um, deciding on, and so we thought it would be more relevant and interesting to hear from some of them. Uh, I, as I think you may figured out, uh, was born and grew up here in Missoula, and um, after high school, I left uh, to go to Lewis and Clark College, which is in Portland, Oregon. And one of the reasons I chose to go to Lewis and Clark College is that they have a really uh, extensive study abroad program and uh, with a focus on sort of non-traditional study abroad sites so more than half of their sites are in developing countries which was really appealing to me and in my junior year of college I was able to go to um, Kenya for five months and did a uh, interesting study abroad where it really wasn't very much classroom based but more experiential so a lot of homestays, did some intensive Swahili, um, spent time uh, living and um, learning from the Samburu, who are a pastoral nomadic tribe similar to the Maasai, um, and uh, got to do homestays there as well, which was a really um, fascinating experience for me. And then um, got to work on an independent study project, which I did on um, sort of ways that uh, traditional healers are incorporated into the medical system in Kenya and um, sort of how people choose what form of 
uh, care they're going to seek in terms of more um, traditional versus modern medicine. So that was what I focused my independent study during that time. And then uh, after I graduated from Lewis and Clark, I uh, went to medical school at Harvard um, and became interested in family medicine early on. Harvard Medical School is not, um, it, it doesn't have a strong reputation for family medicine. They don't have a family medicine. We had, I knew that primary care was something that I was interested in, and they had a primary care interest meeting and um, had different people come and talk about what they do within primary care. And when the family medicine doctor spoke about what she did, um, which is basically to provide care to entire families, sort of um, birth to death type of model of care, it immediately resonated with me and was something that I became very interested in. Um, while I was in medical school, I had the opportunity to extend my training by a year and was able to spend some time overseas again and did both um, a couple of months of intensive medical Spanish and clinical work in Guatemala and then also got to spend another five months in East Africa uh, working in Tanzania this time on a small island um, uh, just north of Zanzibar called Pemba, which is a, um, very heavily influenced by Arab culture. It's an entirely Muslim community, traditional Muslim community, and um, got to work on a research project looking at um, hookworm infections among elementary school children who had been treated with multiple courses of mebendazole medication to look at whether they were developing resistance. So it involved a lot of um, analyzing stool samples under microscopes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> that was a very interesting uh, cultural experience and I was really very fortunate I think to be able to do that because at least at the time that I was in medical school there really wasn't any sort of registry of places to be able to select to go do internships or rotations and so it was really just word of mouth and I think the fact that I had been to Kenya earlier and been able to learn some Swahili um, enabled me to be able to get to go to this site in Tanzania, which was, um, which was a great opportunity for me. So I, I went into residency having a lot of interest in sort of international medicine and working overseas. That was something that um, I had found very interesting. And when I was in residency, um, my husband and I had the opportunity to do a rotation in, up in Browning on the Blackfeet Indian Reservation during our third year and um, just really loved it. Uh, we were lucky enough to be there in August, which is an absolutely beautiful time of year to be up uh, on the Blackfeet Indian Reservation. It's very close to glacier and the days are super long, so you have time to really explore um, before and after work if you want. So I had some opportunities to spend over in the park. It did snow in August, <laughs> but um, we came away from that rotation. I think up until that point, we'd really thought that we had wanted to go back overseas after we graduated and volunteer overseas. And we came away from that rotation realizing that a lot of the reasons why we wanted to go overseas in terms of working cross-culturally, working um, in a more underserved community were really possible. Um, it, by working for the Indian Health Service. And so we started to apply to different sites um, in the Indian Health Service uh, and were able to get jobs working in Zuni, New Mexico, which is a small um, Pueblo community um, up in the high desert of uh, New Mexico, um, a community of about 10,000 people. And the Zuni community, um, Pueblo is surrounded by the larger Navajo nation, so we were treating both Navajo and Zuni patients. And uh, I was the director of the women's health program in Zuni. My husband was the director of the diabetes program, so we got to do a lot of community outreach and prevention type activities um, within the community. And got to practice in a place where 
really family medicine is the only model of medicine um, that's available immediately. So anything that walked through the door, we would take care of. So we would cover the emergency room, we would cover all deliveries that happened, we did all the pediatric care, um, and it's an amazing community. It's, um, it's a very cohesive community and most people who live there live there their entire lives. So it was not unusual for us to be treating a patient who might be 80 or 90 years old at the end of their life and the chart that we would have would have the original like when they were there as a kid like the notes that the doctors had written back in the 1930s so it was pretty amazing um, to have that kind of continuity and also a full family medicine experience in terms of a really important and cohesive extended family network and structure so a lot of um, cousins, aunts, uncles, grandparents, a lot of people who live together in, um, in the same uh, housing units, often extended family members all living together, who um, would not be unusual to have somebody come into the emergency room um, for an emergency and, or for a delivery, for example, have 10 other family members in the room with them, of which, you know, three of whom you may have seen as patients at different times, and it, it really was an eye-opening experience in that way to be able to really practice in a, in a true, what I think is a family medicine model. So we did that for eight years, and then moved back to Missoula to help start up uh, this residency program, the Family Medicine Residency of Western Montana. Prior to this program starting, there was only one other residency program in the entire state, which was in Billings. And, um, you know, I think it's important to note that a lot, of, um, a lot of people end up practicing in the same general area where they do their residency training. And so for Montana not to have had any residency programs in the western part of the state um, really puts it at a strong disadvantage in terms of being able to provide physicians to work in various communities. And Montana is historically a very underserved uh, state in terms of healthcare providers. Um, out of the 56 counties that we have in the state, 11 of them have no physicians whatsoever, and 54 out of the 56 are health professional shortage areas. So there is a lot of need in this state. And even in this community, Missoula, uh, working at Partnership Health Center, which is a federally qualified community health center. We have patients who travel up to two hours to come to get their primary care at our facility because um, we don't require that patients have insurance in order to be, get to, to be seen. So about half of our patients have no insurance at all and can get seen on a sliding scale fee. Another 15 to 20 percent are Medicaid or Medicare, which a lot of other providers within this community limit the number of Medicaid or Medicare patients that they're willing to see. Um, and then our, you know, the smallest number are patients who are insured, but we see those at our clinic as well. So even within a community like Missoula that has a lot of physicians, there is a lot of need, and we see that a lot in the clinic where we work here as well. So I think in many ways, um, that original sort of interest on my part in terms of working with underserved populations and being able to work with people from a lot of different backgrounds um, has really followed through um, in all the various settings that I've worked at. And I think even, you know, within a community, the same community that I grew up in, I think a lot of those objectives are still being, being met um, that in some ways were inspired by those those early international experiences. So, so that's sort of my story in a nutshell. I'm going to let the residents talk about their experiences as well, and then we'll definitely open it up for any other questions that you guys might have. So I'm Emma Wright. I'm from Vermont, which hopefully all of you know is a state. Some people west of the Mississippi do not. but <laughs> um, And I went to Harvard College for undergrad, and I studied social studies, thought I would probably never be in a science class again, um, and focused on international development and thinking about mostly education and how it played a role. Um, I did thesis research in Cape, outside of Cape Town, South Africa at a high school. Um, and it was probably there that I had the first exposure to 
work in international health. I lived with um, someone who worked for Doctors Without Borders and another South African who worked for the Treatment Action Campaign, which did a lot of advocacy around um, HIV medications. And so I first, I think that was where I got my first inkling that this was something that I was interested in. But as I was thinking about what I would do after college, I really wanted to get some better perspective on what international development looked like and what role might fit me best because I was really interested in education and its role, but I also, I just wasn't quite sure what made the most sense for me. Um, I really wanted an opportunity to get that perspective without having a very strong or like superimposed agenda. Um, and I joined the Peace Corps, which actually really fulfilled that goal in a, in a in a cool way. And so um, when I applied, they sort of base your placement on language skills that you have and, um, you know, in your interest and in what other kind of skills you have. And I grew up on a farm and worked, did a lot of work gardening and things like that. And so I was an agriculture volunteer. Um, so that was my official assignment. But as many people who are involved in the Peace Corps find out, um, that that was sort of like the tip of the iceberg of the different things that I ended up doing in the small village that I ended up living in. So I was assigned to um, a small town called Wollongatoba Soba in Mali, in West Africa. Um, it was about a half a day travel from the capital, which is called Bamako. Um, and I was in a place only accessible by dirt roads. Very few cars ever came out there. Usually I would have to sort of walk from my my village to the main market town or bike or something like that to get transport out of the village. So it was pretty remote. Um, with the Peace Corps, some of you may be familiar with it, how it sort of is structured, but you generally get about eight weeks of training in the country um, that includes sort of cultural training and language training before you're dispersed to your respective villages. And um, I was in a placement where I was alone. Some people are in bigger towns, and so they have other volunteers sort of closer by. The closest other person to me was, or other volunteer to me was about, uh, probably about 15 kilometers or so away. Um, and so I sort of set about on this, figuring out what I was going to do. And this, I didn't have any particular assignment. It was all sort of up to me to figure out. And I had some basic bomber skills after the eight weeks of training. That's the main local language. Um, and some French from high school and college French. But almost nobody in the village spoke any French. So it was um, sort of using the local teachers who did speak some French to translate into Bambara and kind of figure out what was going on in the village. and. Um, I spent a lot of time just asking and meeting with groups of people. Um, it's a pretty traditional Muslim uh, culture, although there's sort of a hybrid with animism, so a lot of traditional beliefs in combination with this sort of superimposed um, Islam, which was really interesting. Um, and so the men and women tended to have their separate associations within the village and met separately um, to discuss sort of what their needs were and their um, thoughts for how I could help them. Um, and so I worked on two projects that were sort of more agricultural based. Um, one was a chicken raising project where I um, helped the, men, the men's group in the village uh, integrate some newer breeds of chickens um, to increase the um, sort of a lot of the local chickens were pretty scrawny and so and not good layers and so to sort of improve the local stock um, which involved teaching them how to vaccinate the chickens figuring like figuring out sources of nutrition like termites for these new chickens um, figuring out housing all these things um, and then the women asked me to help them with some irrigation in the garden so these were sort of my like agriculture based projects but I ended up also teaching in the school and um, and then after being there for about a year, I sort of started feeling myself drawn to thinking about um, issues of malnutrition, especially I had a, a baby die in the host family that I was living in. Um, and it was very, it was sort of not such a big deal or not outwardly such a big deal to the family because they were so accustomed to having, um, having this kind of mortality. But for me, it was pretty, it made a pretty big impact, I think. And, so I started wanting to find out more about how maternal and child health was, like what the systems were in place. And I worked in, um, I asked the local doctor in the market town where I was living whether I could help him out. And 
basically I just went when he was doing maternity prenatal visits and um, weighing babies after they were born and vaccinations and things like that. But it gave me, I think, a lot of insight into um, a lot of the themes that I've found um, resonate with what I'm doing in family medicine now. But so it's sort of where I started to see the importance of thinking about patients' context in, in caring for them, thinking about how much of a role humility can play in, in forging relationships with people, um, and thinking about how much you can do in a resource poor setting to, to help people out. Um, and it was sort of there that I found like this, I had really wanted to do something that would help people on a very fundamental level and education was one route that I could have chosen, I think, but I, I found like the concrete skills that I thought I could acquire in medicine were in the a body of knowledge sounded, seemed really appealing to me as something concrete that I could um, grasp onto to help people. And so that was sort of the beginning of my interest in medicine. Um, and I won't spend so long talking about the whole rest of my trajectory, but um, I came back from the Peace Corps after 27 months and did uh, two years of pre-med. So I basically did, you know, what I would have done in undergrad over two years um, and then went to medical school and thought, I wasn't sure whether I would do, um, for a while I think I thought about infectious disease because I really liked microbiology. Um, but I, I, as soon as I started medical school, I think my interest was in primary care sort of from the get-go. And part of it is because of the sort of more universal applicability of the skills that you acquire in family medicine. There's such, it's such a broad training that you really get to do everything. But I think a huge part of it for me was also having come from this background of thinking about things in terms of social context and um, economic forces and all sorts of other things that family medicine has a different lens on the patient than a lot of other specialties. And that's probably hard to appreciate from a perspective of not being immersed in that in the medical culture, um, as we all are, but there's there's much more attention. It's not just sort of what we do as family physicians. So we see all pay, all ages of patients. We do all sorts of procedures. We deliver babies. Um, but I think there's also much more emphasis on thinking about the whole person and the whole person as part of their community. And that was really appealing to me. Um, and in medical school, I did not do any international work. And um, part of that is comes from having a young family. I have a daughter now who's two. And um, part of it, and sort of feeling like I wanted to transition more to doing Medicine, rural medicine in the United States, and I did a great rotation in Valdez, Alaska, that kind of reinforced again the sort of something that um, Narissa was mentioning, the fact that there's a lot of overlap between providing care in a uh, resource poor um, international setting and a rural setting in the United States. Um, and so I came to this residency specifically because it has a mission of training people for rural practice. Um, and and that's, I think, who knows, I may end up working internationally when I, my kids are grown and gone from the house. But at this point, I feel like it's there's a lot of fulfilling opportunity in um, practicing rural medicine here. My name is Justin Perry, and I grew up in Fort Benton, Montana. There's a set of Great Falls, my family farm there. So I just grew up on the family farm. Um, I went to college at Montana State in Bozeman. No, no <laughs> cheers there? Okay. And I actually did a civil engineering degree. And so I had no inclination of going into medicine or even international stuff at that time. And so I did my civil engineering degree and got a job in Bozeman, which I was excited about just because that meant I could ski and mountain bike. And that was content on life if I could just do those two <laughs> things. But I think after like a year or two of work, I realized I just didn't really enjoy what I was doing. And so I quit my job and ended up going with a volunteer group. And I worked in Cambodia for three months. And while I was in Cambodia, I worked with an orphanage I just call Slash AIDS Village. And so I was just really, I wasn't doing anything medical there. I was building stuff. Um, but there was these families that had AIDS. And as their kids died, they'd become part of the orphanage. And so I just worked with the kids a lot, teaching them English, just doing a lot of that. And I would also, and I was like 30 kilometers out of Phnom Penh. And about once a week, I would drive into Phnom Penh on a motorbike, and we'd like, me and a couple of other friends, we would go visit the pediatric hospital there and just kind of hang out with the kids. And one of my buddies would play the guitar, sing them songs. We'd just kind of hang out with them. 
it's all in that experience. I was just like, oh man, this is so much more fulfilling than my engineering job. I mean, just being inter able to interact with these kids and all these people. At that time, when I left Cambodia, came back to Bozeman, started my engineering job again, and I was just like, man, maybe I should go to med school. But then I talked to an advisor, and I was like, two more years of classes, and I was like, not doing it. <laughs> just no way. And so I'd worked as an engineer for like another year and realized I was doing. And I was kind of at a loss for what to do, so I just quit my job and took off traveling. And in my travels, I had the intention of going back to Cambodia and just showing up at the village I'd worked at before. And I got sidetracked in Vietnam, and I met a doctor there in Hanoi, and he worked with leprosy camps. Just in the northern Vietnam, there's 13 leprosy camps alone there, and there's probably another 15 or 16 in southern Vietnam. And a lot of these people were placed in these camps back in the 1950s when French Indochina and all the wars were going on then. And so most of these people were treated, um, but they were just living with the disability. And so he was the guy I was working with was Dr. Chu. He had, he grew up in Vietnam, was a retired doctor. He had left Vietnam in 70, it was 75 when Saigon fell, then retired in the U.S. and was going back now just volunteering his time to the Vietnamese people. And so he just basically, I became his kind of his right-hand man. For the next six months, I lived with him and worked with him. And we would go to leprosy camps every, every couple of weeks because we had to get permission from the government. We'd take in supplies and we would bring them blankets, and basically we would just hang out with the people at the leprosy camp because they would been basically isolated. A lot of them hadn't seen their own families in 40, 50 years. A lot of old people. And there's children growing up on the leprosy camps because once you're in these rural areas like that in Vietnam, you're kind of just considered a leper if you grew up on the camp. You don't really ever leave it. And it was just such a rewarding, just awesome experience, you know, just meeting these people. Um, I was really inspired by this Dr. Chu. And there was a lot of downtime there, too. We weren't at the leprosy camps. And so, because of Dr. Chu's influence there, there's a medical school in Hanoi. And so I started running an English program for the resident doctors at the university of the medical school there. So basically, every night, I'd meet with all the resident doctors that were interested in learning, expanding their language, English skills, and I would just hang out with them. And it was just more socially. They already knew basic English, but trying to get them so that when they went to medical conferences, they could understand what was being shared with them. And they just became my closest friends. And while I was there, I think just their influence that there were these doctors that were like my age. And I was interested in what they were doing. They were sharing the crazy stories of them. And they were these Vietnamese doctors, you know, what they were doing. And I think my experiences at the leprosy camps and at the orphanage there, while I was in Vietnam, I was like, I think I want to go to med school. And so, I, I mean, I was planning to stay in Vietnam for two years when I initially kind of got there. And then I was realized Montana State had a post back pre-med program. So I flew back, moved back to Bozeman, and took my two years of classes so I could apply to med school. Um, right prior to med school, just because I had this engineering background, that summer before med school, I got asked to go to Kenya. And being, I had an engineering degree, and in my license, they was asked to supervise engineers without borders there in Kenya, like we were building these water projects and building on wells for schools and then trying to create distribution systems for them because there in Kenya, the girls, it's kind of, you know, the sexist thing, the girls had to carry water and stuff. And so they, they felt like by building these wells and stuff like that, you could help improve the education of the kids, especially the girls, because they weren't getting sent off carrying water all the time. And it was just a really cool project that I got to do right before med school started. Um, the big thing, I think, the reason I went into family medicine was, I mean, I grew up in Montana, a little farm town. And to me, a doctor was a family practice doc. I didn't know there were specialists, really. I, mean, I think I was kind of naive what the medical field was about. And because our hometown doc, was, had been there, he was my grandpa's age, and he's been the doc there for 40 years. And that's the doctor. Like, that's what I knew of a doctor. Um, but then also, from my international experience, I really realized I wanted to be able to, in the future, go back and do international medicine. And I felt when I was in med school that the skill set developed as a family practice doctor would allow me to do deliveries if I was overseas, gave me a good foundation in medicine in general, like in pediatric and in adult medicine. And so that, it was coupled also wanting to move back to maybe a more rural area like I grew up in. That was really why I led me to family medicine. And then with this residency program being here, this was my opportunity to kind of come back home. So that's kind of my story. Uh, so, my name is Felicia Lucas. Uh, I'm also a, a first year resident with the rest of these guys. And my uh, international travel is a little bit 
different in the sense that a lot of mine was not chosen. So both my parents were in the Air Force, so I was born in California, then moved to Tokyo, then moved to Illinois, then to Hawaii, then to Boise, Idaho. And I also lived in Turkey, Mexico, and the Philippines for several months at a time, and that was all before turning 16. Um, and so when I got to college, too, so I went to the University of Southern California. I graduated with a degree in health promotion, disease prevention, and minors in natural sciences and bioethics. And I think the combination of a lot of public health policy and ethics training really drew me towards primary care. Uh, and I continued to travel. Um, and so between college and going up into med school, I went to uh, let's see, the Netherlands, France, Germany, Italy, India, Palau, Thailand. Um, oh, a couple, couple other random places in Europe. Um, and then when I got to medical school, uh, instead of taking one of my six-week electives to do like an audition rotation, I spent uh, five weeks in Costa Rica instead. And I've just always found international travel to be really fulfilling and it's just what I'm drawn to. But kind of like what Justin was saying too, like <laughs> almost everywhere except rich places in Europe and even then, um, usually the doctors you encounter in anywhere besides the United States are primary care doctors. Like that's the face of medicine. It's the doctor you go to for everything. You know, if, if your daughter has a cut, you go to the doctor. If you think your husband's having a heart attack, you go to the doctor. If you're pregnant and you need something, you go to the doctor. You don't go to an OB, a cardiologist, a dermatologist. Like Those things just didn't really, they weren't prevalent in my life or in my travel. And when I got into public health, I didn't see them, I didn't see those people holding the position in healthcare that I wanted to hold. I wanted to be closer to kind of your average Joe, because that's who I interacted with for the most part. And there's a, a real formative kind of experience. So my, my mother is Filipina. Um, she grew up on a Philippine orphanage because her mom, my grandma, was abandoned there after her mom died in childbirth. And so she, my grandma wound up growing up to be kind of the superintendent of the orphanage. And so my family, we would go back. And I remember there was the doctor for the orphanage and he had this dinky little bamboo hut and he had you know some band-aids a big bottle of isopropyl alcohol and you know a couple other things i mean they didn't even have like an ice machine you know there was a kerosene lantern in the corner and i was just like what kind of health care does this guy provide and he actually provided pretty amazing health care for kind of a jungle isolated orphanage in the philippines and what was really impressive to me was how he did so much with so little, and that so little meant so much to the orphanage. And not just the kids in the orphanage, but the orphanage would have a reputation in the town, and people knew if they needed something, even if they weren't an orphan, they could be safe going to the orphanage, asking the doctor there, just because it was seen as a place you know, where people would come together that were abandoned by other people and there was somebody there who would help them. And that would, that just really spoke to me. And through, so throughout my life, whenever I encountered healthcare, I was always more focused on the person who was giving that to somebody, that, that feeling, you know, because I, I worked in a state capital and I did a bunch of public health policy. And you can say like, oh, we passed a, you know, a smoking ban in restaurants that saved 10,000 lives this year. But those are just numbers on a paper. They're not people you get to interact with. And I might never save 10,000 people in my entire life's work, but it's a lot more meaningful to me to interact with them on a daily basis rather than going into a courtroom or to the Senate. And I think that's an important part of primary care as well, to have that in your purview. But I just always thought being a medical doctor in that role was much more important to me. And any time I traveled, it was really the GP. That's what they call them everywhere else, general practitioner. The GP was the person you went to. And 
it was just very odd. I didn't think I was going to do family medicine because I went to medical school at the University of Washington, um, which has this whole renowned thing for being rural medicine practice. And, and it was great that I did the whammy program and I came out to places like the Crow Agency, um, which is almost like international travel. Same with going to Fairbanks, Alaska in November. I mean, it's a whole other thing. But the family medicine doctors in Seattle, I mean, they really were kind of like internists and they would refer because there's so many wonderful specialists in Seattle. And then coming out to, you know, more rural places, more places that, like rural Montana is more like urban Philippines than urban America, if that makes sense. And so it just makes more, I don't know, it just feels more homey to me. Like this is where I'm supposed to be, this is where I'm supposed to click into the community. And here you get to do the doctor, you get to be the doctor, not, you know, the person before you see the cardiologist. And so I just really like it. And I think a lot of my travel experiences help me understand that more often than not, no matter where you are in the world, people are more like other people than not. You know, I can take any random Chinese person and any random Guatemalan person, and I guarantee you they have a significant amount in common, whether or not they think or know that. And the human body, I mean, we can break it down into, you know, blood and lymph and nerve impulses and certain weights of copper and whatnot, but it doesn't, it doesn't give you that human interaction that you can find anywhere in the world. And I just think when you value human interaction, that primary care is a natural calling. That's kind of my deal. Questions? <laughs> Comments? <laughs> Sounds like all four of you have a great deal of empathy and really enjoy working with um, patients at a personal level. Um, do you think that your experiences international and in your own practice has either built on your your empathy to start, or it has provided empathy in general? I mean, at least for me, I think going international, I had this idea that everyone kind of grew up like I did. And then you just get a lot of humility, you know, going overseas. Because you see people that aren't living the same lives we live. They have a lot of struggles and dealing with a lot of things that I had never comprehended that people grow up with. But the amazing thing about it was they're so happy. Like, they're so happy with what they have, even though they, by our standards, they have nothing. And I think just maybe learning that, I mean, that's why I push everyone that if you have those opportunities to go do a volunteer project overseas, or I mean, it doesn't even have to be overseas, but you just learn, I don't know, just a level of humility because you realize that people have so little. And I think that helps make you empathetic because you realize there's a lot of people out there that don't have the same gifts or the same opportunities or the same basic means. It's interesting because I think you're asking a chicken and the egg question that's really common in medical training, especially now. People are saying, can we teach empathy? Is it that people start with empathy and we train it out of them sometimes? So it's really complicated and I think it varies a little bit for everybody, but I think especially for family medicine, people who are drawn to that are, are tend to be people who start out with a great deal of empathy and a lot of medical providers, but and hope to um, and, and sort of value those like interpersonal interactions like Felicia was mentioning. Um, and I think that it's, it varies a lot whether our training and our interactions with patients fosters that or makes it harder because our work is really hard too. Um, and so I think we all work really hard to try to maintain it um, even when we're feeling kind of, you know, run down and <laughs> exhausted and yeah. other things. Yeah. And I'd, I'd say you know, along with that too. So you build your empathy, but it's not like a binary thing. Like you flip on the switch and it's just there. Like you can gain more empathy and expand on it, but you have to work to maintain it. So like an example that comes to my head, you know, I'm more empathetic to people when I travel, but travel isn't always like third world travel, right? I mean, you go to very industrialized, like touristy, very well off places too, and you still have to have empathy for those people. So you ever heard of hashtag first world problems? 
I felt that all the time, like in my office. I'm like, you're rich, you have a car. Like, why are you complaining to me about your anxiety problems? Like, versus somebody who's 13 years old working a full-time job because her mom's a drug addict. Like, I still, I still have to work to have empathy for the people with resources who don't remind, who are in stark contrast to the people who I encounter from international travel. But that's not to say everybody I encounter in international travel is poor and uneducated. That's certainly not the truth. So I just have to make sure that I still am empathetic towards the human condition and not towards a socioeconomic status, if that makes sense. I also really like the emphasis that Justin put on humility because I think it's something that I don't, I think it's been completely integral to to any time that I've felt like I have forged good relationships with my patients, my coworkers, family and friends, honestly. But, and I don't know how you get that, but I do think that traveling internationally and being in places where you feel like, I, where you're confronted with things that you don't know how to handle or um, problems that seem sort of insurmountable, I think it's, I think it's, and, and to see that joy that people have in spite of the adversity that they're facing, which sounds super cheesy as I say it, but like, it, you just, you become, I think, more, or a lot of people have the opportunity to become more humble in those settings, and I think that goes a long way toward any career in service, and yeah. I admit, though, just from having those experiences, sometimes it makes my job harder here because it makes it easier for me to judge my fellow Ameri you know, my patients here because they have so much more, which is never a fair statement to say because a poor person in, say, in Cambodia, everyone's poor around them, so they're not judged for being poor and really having nothing. Where here in America, someone that's poor by American standards would be rich in Cambodia but they're looked down upon, there's a lot of shame in their level that they're at. And so I always have to remind myself of that because it's easy to look at the person, my patient I see here, and I'm like, compared to my Cambodian friend, you're, you have everything. Because it's not a fair, it's not a, it's not a fair comparison to them. It's not, you know, it's just not fair to them. And I do think that there's, you know, like kind of almost an automatic em empathy too, though, that you get if you go to a place, especially where you don't speak the native language and you don't look like you're from that country because it reminds you as a strong, grown, educated adult, you're very vulnerable. And I think, you know, our patients come to us vulnerable and trying to have that experience to fall back on can just inherently build a lot of empathy too. Just remembering what it was like to be scared and alone and not have all the answers and hopefully things turn out okay. that like all three of you tended to like choose to go to medical school I guess in like a non-traditional way and you know um, instead of just going right after undergrad and I was just curious why you decided to go to med school, medical school opposed to like becoming a mid-level care provider like a PA or an MP and still end up working in primary care background. Very good question. Yeah, I mean that, <laughs> at least for me that sometimes I still wonder. I debated that. I looked up PA schools when I decided to go into medicine and really strongly considered that, but I also had this goal of maybe going overseas and doing work internationally. At the time, when I was looking it up, I just felt a lot of people don't even, there's people in the United States that don't even know what a PA is, let alone trying to maybe get opportunities overseas as a PA. And so I knew if I got a medical degree from the United States that everyone knows what that is, you know, and so that was one of the things I balanced. I think it's also, I mean, for me it was thinking about like literally about what kind of training I wanted to have and not just about what, like which field I wanted to be doing it in. Because so, uh, you know, every, you know, a nurse practitioner and a PA and a, an MD or a DO, you know, we all, even functioning in primary care, have a little bit of a different perspective. So for me, it was really important. And each of those trainings has a different degree of pathophysiology that they do and basic science that they do. And, and I think that there's value to all of those levels of training. And now we're working so much more in a team. Um, but to me, I really, I really wanted, I got like kind of nerded out on the microbiology and the pathophysiology. And I really liked that. And it was worth it to me to spend that time doing 
doing that training. Um, and I think that there's still a role for physicians trained in, obviously I think that because I'm doing it, but um, in primary care. And I think that it's kind of a disservice to, um, to, to primary care in general, this is sort of assumption that, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, it's all sort of the same and we can, I don't know, that we don't need that mix of types of providers. Um, and for me, it was similar to what Justin was saying. Like, I always saw myself as continuing to travel. So I know an American medical degree goes over very far and wide, and I don't have to retest in a lot of places to practice medicine. I don't know what it's like for PAs. And, um, and honestly, for me, it was like University of Washington or bust because I had a very specific goal in mind of doing lots of travel. And so they have the whammy program where so I spent 10 and a half out of my 12 months and third year not in Seattle. And the school pays for it, pays for you to go to Alaska, Montana, Idaho, all kinds of places. So that it was that program specifically. But in general, I wanted to be able to have some sort of degree that's like an international passport. An American medical degree is pretty close because it's one of the more expensive. Well, I've got a question for you. Um, you know, I thought your talks were all very inspirational. And, uh, and, I, and I, I really see and like the connections that, that you've made between your interests in working overseas and your interests in primary care and, and rural care. Um, but I, there's, a, there's a kind of underlying contradiction here in my way of thinking that maybe you should you can set me straight up. And the, the problem is this, that isn't this residency program, and I'm, I'll include Narissa in this, isn't this residency program taking you away from international contributions and that motivation that got you started? Because now, you're going to work in rural United States, which, as Justin just said, the people there are much better off than most people in Cambodia are, even in, even the poor in rural parts of the United States. Have we lost you? No, I actually bring up a real good question because that was one of my hardest decisions when I decided to do this. Because when I decided to go to medical school, because I had to take two years of post back classes, then medical school, then residency, I my international experiences kind of became my, my passion. Like it was the most fulfilling times of my life. And it was really sad to let go of that, to go to medical school. Because I basically knew for like the next 10, 12, 15 years that I wasn't going to be able to do that very much. Because for me, just from my experiences before, I want to go somewhere for at least three months. I don't, just so I can really get to know the people. And so a week trip for me is, it, it's not going to be, it's not going to, I'm not going to get out of what, what I want, and I don't know if I can do as much as I'd like to there, which is for selfish reasons, probably, you know, just developing the relationships of people there in you know, these other countries. And so that was a real hard choice because I, I realized that once I t decided to take off for school that I was missing out on what I really enjoyed doing for a while. But you're not, you're not ruling it out down the road. I mean, I, I heard Emma say the same thing. Yeah. That, you know, what, 10, 15, 20 years from now. But you know, there's another, another way of looking at this, and, uh, and that's been, I think, captured by many of the other lectures in this lecture series. And so I encourage you, if you haven't already, to try to come to some of the remaining ones, or at least um, check out the ones that have gone already uh, by looking at the uh, Montana Public Television taping of those lecture series. Because what we found here is we've got an amazing group of people who practice in mostly western Montana. We have one person who comes from Livingston, but most of the rest came from western Montana. But who also spent substantial portions of their, uh, of their year. And I agree with you, a week doesn't do it. But these people who go overseas for you know three weeks sometimes, um, you know, you've got the George Reese's, every one of them. For example, Charlotte uh, 
Kutch, who's a dermatologist here in town, has worked on with leprosy in Cambodia. You should talk to Charlotte. I think you'd be inspired by that. And she goes there every year. So you don't, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. And so I would encourage all of you to think about ways in which you can practice in this country, but still give part of your uh, life to serving others in other parts. There's, there's a Dr. Ramsey in Bozeman. But he's had an amazing story where for a number of years, I don't know if it was 10, 12 years, however, he spent almost nine months a year in Africa. And he's part of a practice, family practice, practice in Bozeman. Then he'd come back, and one of the partners would take off for three months. And so I'd realized that hearing his story, knowing who he was, that there's possibilities. And like if you can find the right partners in practice, future that I wasn't given up doing the international stuff forever, that if I can find the right person to work with where we can make our practice flexible. So that was kind of my own answer to that, too, having met him and him sharing his story, how he was able to do what he created. I also think that it's interesting thinking about, so there's need, there's international need. There's need in western Montana, and there are different kinds of need. But like I think we tend to, I don't know, I, I think you have to figure out where you as an individual can be the most useful, and that takes into account family situations and all sorts of things. And I, I think I like to think of my career as a as an evolution as it has been already up until this point and just figuring out how things are going to fit together and not sort of commit you know and I think it's hard in primary care because one of the really appealing things to me is having continuity with my patients um, in whatever setting I'm working in and it's one of the things just like Justin was saying short-term international work doesn't really appeal to me very much and I think after being in one small village where I got to know a very specific community really well it made me even less likely to want to do short-term stints working abroad. And so figuring out how that's going to fit together, I don't, I don't know at this point. But um, Well, I think one of the commonalities uh, in the lectures we've heard among people who do go on short-term uh, trips abroad to, to use what they, their gifts is training. It's not so much practice themselves as it is training others to sustain the kinds of things that they've learned in their own career. So that can be done in a shorter period of time. I don't think you have to feel uh, ashamed for doing that in a short period of time. But I agree with you that you know there's a difference between that actual practice component and the training component. So you might think more along those training lines. What do you have that you can contribute? And you know, I think that question about PAs that Kara raised is is relevant here because one of the things that uh, when we talk about in my class quite a bit is the fact that we've got this fatal flow of expertise, right? We've got these trained doctors who leave countries and come either here or someplace in Europe or someplace in Australia, wherever it might be. Well, one of the ways of dealing with the fatal flow of expertise is to train people who don't have credentials that will allow them to move the other way that you were just talking about, both you and Felicia. You know, okay, this golden passport that you have. Well, these people have also have a golden passport if they get um, an MD. But if they're PAs, or if they are community health workers, or if they are um, you know, nurses uh, assistants, um, then they don't have that golden passport any longer, so they're more likely to stay. So it might be that your role is to train those kinds of people who will stay and carry on in their own countries rather than to leave. So my, my comment on that is I don't know about PAs, but I can tell you that at least in the Philippines, getting a nursing degree is considered your green card. Um, so there are lots of countries in the world where <laughs> exportation of nursing is, is very prevalent. That's happening, in, well, for example, in the UK, there are more nurses today in the UK who were born outside the UK than were born inside the UK. So, okay, so uh, we're not talking about nursing certification either here. We're talking about something less, something less where you have uh, ability to really help in your communities, but you don't have uh, certificates that are going to get you jobs outside. And I would say just even that, and I'm sure you've heard from people who have done this in a really thoughtful way, but even that short-term trip for training has to be in the right, done in the right context. and maybe over multiple years and going to this, I don't know, I just, I think it's important to think about no matter what the amount of time, just being, just being thoughtful about what the, 
the long term impact is, and I don't know. It just well, yeah. I mean, yeah. Isn't that what people have been talking to us about in all of these lectures? Haven't they been sharing with us what they learned that they did right and what they learned that wasn't so right and how those things could be improved? So you're absolutely right. And I think this lecture series, we should probably make it into a book uh, because there's all kinds of great lessons there, just along the lines that you're talking about now. So once again, check out the, the lectures on Montana public television, please. I have a question. Um, when Dr. Miller came and did his lecture, he talked about um, how typically when they're finding that when um, residents, where people do their residency, they end up staying. Do you guys have any ideas of where you guys want to be immediately after your residency? Immediately after residency, I am almost 100% sure I will be somewhere in Montana. After that, I'm not committing to anything. <laughs> I am constantly looking at job and housing listings around the Flathead Lake area all the time. I would just mention that Felicia is one of our residents who is in the Kalispell track. So she's done her first year here in Missoula, but then will be going um, to Kalispell this summer to do her second and third year training in Kalispell. So she'll get lots of exposure to Flathead Lake. <laughs> And I'm certain I'm staying in Montana. I mean, that was the whole reason I wanted to do residency here. The only, I have a buddy of mine that's doing residency in OHSU in Portland, and he's always trying to convince me to move to Idaho because that's where he's from. But I'm trying to convince him to come to Montana, so we'll see. I would just say I did my residency training in Washington, but I grew up in Montana, and that, that trumps it. So. <laughs> so. I just want to say that you brought up a really good point that I appreciated was the fact that you know, when I've gone overseas, um, my work efforts there don't make an impact. I mean, they do. They're important to me, and I make great friendships there. But it's really like having people there, like the training aspect, going over as a physician to train people there to have like longevity. And that's something I hope I don't forget about because I've been, that's been about real valuable lesson I've learned before about, you know, what's the, I don't remember the proper term for that, but... Sustainability. Yeah, sustainability. That's the word I was looking for. Because me going over there, it's fulfilling for me. It's great. It's pat on my back. I mean, there's a lot of that that feels great about it. But really, for it to make a real big difference, you'd have to have that sustainability where people that are there full time are able to have those skills. Well, I had a student who did an um, honor thesis with me this year. And also, this is a subject that we talk about in my class. And, and that is. Let's take Doctors Without Borders, for example. Okay, so Doctors Without Borders, it's a great organization. They send doctors abroad usually for six years, I mean six month tours. Um, they do great things while they're there, but they leave. They leave when the crisis is over. And one of the, the complaints, and you can see this in, in films that are done about Doctors Without Borders, is the local medical workers are in tears when Doctors Without Borders are leaving because all of the things that have been in place while Doctors Without Borders was there are going to leave with them. And so it's the same issue that we're facing right now in terms of the Ebola centers that President Obama set up in Liberia. You know, those places are empty right now. Um, they created too many of these. And what they haven't done is found a way to convert those into normal public health centers that can be serving the people of Liberia after the Ebola outbreak is over. And this is where we really are failing, it seems to me, in a lot of respects in terms of our international efforts. We, we, the Doctors Without Borders types go in, do a great job, but who's going to carry on after they leave? So there is a role to play for emergency care. But there's also that sustainability dimension that we tend to overlook. I'm sorry I got off on this. I wasn't getting, supposed to give the lecture tonight. Uh, but anyway, it really inspired me as well as I think many of the people uh, in this room today. So let's give a round of thanks to all of our speakers. And, you know, um, Felicia, just for your information, I, I keep tying the lecture series. But I always, at this point in time, talk about what's coming up next week. Well, guess what? Next week, we're going to have Lisa Fleischer, an MD who is a family medicine practitioner at the Kalispell Regional Medical Center. And Lisa's going to talk to us about the volunteer, the longitudinal medical volunteer work that she does in St. Lucia. And she goes there every year. And so it would be really interesting to kind of uh, 
get from her some of the ways in which she's able to do that and able to practice medicine here and do that stuff in St. Lucia at the same time. So that's what we have on tap for next week. And if you want to talk to any of these people tonight, please come right up and talk to them after we finish here today. So once again, thanks very much.